Oh, oh, there you go. I'm sorry, brother. Uh, Ron, there you go. All right, listen, I'm about to jump on here with uh, Divine Prospect. Come on in. Oh, bless you, my friend. Peace and blessings, King. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good, man. No complaints. Can't complain. First of all, let me say congratulations, my friend. You uh, just had it was a baby boy, right? Yes, yes. Man, yes, congratulations, sir. my brother. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. What about you? Are your baby making days over? Oh man, they long go. <laughs> <laughs> my, my baby turned 24 this year. Wow. That's yeah. What's up. Yeah, That's yeah. Up. So 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 if my wife tell me she pregnant, it better be <laughs> it better be another divine uh conception. You can go talk about another Abraham and Sarah situation, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right, nice seeing you. Thank you for having me on. Um, you know, every time I see you on, I love engaging yes, with sir. you because you are, you welcome people to come to ask questions like yes. I do on my platform. And I know the last time we we had a like a very one on one discussion, it was really long. So tonight, I don't want to keep you long, right? Okay, yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. However, there were some things you were saying that you know, there's some things I agree with, some things I disagree with, right? Sure. Uh, one of the things I would like to ask you about is Genesis chapter twenty six and verse five. I would like to know what your stance is on that in relation to uh, what we see in Hebrews chapter 11 and also mm -hmm. what we see in uh, in uh, Romans. Let me get it real quick. All right, and that would be Romans 4 and 3. So you could do Genesis, uh, if you could do for me real quick, Genesis 26 and 5, and um, just exegete that for me real quick. Sure. And I'll put it on the screen here. Right here it says, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So, and I'm I'm glad. Go ahead. Go ahead if you want to. No, no. I was just going to ask you. So can you can you explain what that what that means in, in regards to Abraham? V very good. And I'm glad you brought that question up because a lot of people think that, you know, when we talk about we're not being under the law, they immediately think that that we're we're antinomian, you know what I mean? We're lawless, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's just not the case. Adam had laws that he, and he broke the law, which was not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When he broke that law, right? Sin came into the world. And so mm -hmm. uh, Cain and Abel evidently had laws, right? When Cain murdered Abel, it was a sin, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. first murder. So even under what we would consider the new covenant, which we're under now, even under grace, right? We're under the law of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we all have law. So in talking about Abraham, mm -hmm. Abraham obeyed the statutes and commands that were given to him from God. It's just as clear as day. And a true born again believer, mm -hmm. one who truly has faith, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, God counted him righteous, Prior to any of that, before circumcision, he believed God and mm -hmm. God counted it unto him for righteousness, according to mm -hmm. Romans, mm -hmm. uh, not as a result of works, mm -hmm. but a person who truly has faith will produce good works. And that's what the true Christian belief is. Now, I know there's some hyper grace Christians out there that think they can do anything and still be saved. I'm not one of those. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so Abraham kept his laws and statutes that God gave him walking in faith those things didn't make him righteous his faith god counted his faith as righteousness apart from the deeds of the law so right? all, so our works are works necessary to demonstrate your faith works are not okay i wouldn't use the term necessary i would say that works become therefore the fruit of our faith you understand what i'm saying it's not like a, an apple tree will produce apples you know what I mean? You don't say, well, you know what? If you, you're you not an apple tree during the winter season when there's no fruit on you, right? It's right. still an apple tree, but in time, it's going to validate the fact that it's an apple tree because in the appropriate season, it will produce what's in it. And a true born again believer will produce. So I wouldn't say necessary. I would say consequential to our faith, our good works. Consequential. So you're talking about consequential and meaning con meaning together and sequence meaning something that comes after something else. So you are exactly. in, you're, you're, you're in congruence with what I'm saying then, right? So like, I'll give you an example, right? When we go to Matthew chapter three, verse eight, mm -hmm. uh, this is what uh, you see a situation where Yachanan John is speaking to the Pharisees, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go to uh, verse seven. He says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to mm -hmm. them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit and keeping with repentance. Yes. Now, if we if we look at that same verse and we go to Acts chapter 26 and verse 20, we get a little bit more detail in regards to that, right? Mm -hmm. Six and verse 20, and it says, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing works and keeping with their repentance. Now, you would agree that repentance is one of the first stages of entering into salvation, correct? You must Maybe. repent and return. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So what does the work meet for repentance? What are the performing acts or the works or the performing deeds that you do in keeping with repentance? What's that? Well, it's being led by the spirit of God. It's being obedient to what the scriptures uh, tell us to be obedient to. For example, I am instructed as a born again believer to love my neighbor. And, and again, if I am a born again believer, I will love my neighbor. Uh, or I, don't, don't get me wrong, I can act in disobedience, right? I can act in disobedience to that, and I can be uh, chastised by the Lord for my disobedience. Mm -hmm. But my point is, a true born-again believer who is sincere about his faith, he will produce those good works. And so uh, even when Peter says after Cornelius and his household, the Gentiles had come to saving faith and the Holy Spirit fell upon them in the same way he fell upon the Jews in Acts chapter number two, mm -hmm. Peter says, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. He says this, but whoever fears God and works righteousness is accepted with him. And so this is why I'm glad you're asking these questions because, okay. and even by the way you look at it, uh -huh. It's letting me know that there's, a, <laughs> that there's a concept out there that Christians don't believe that our salvation should, uh, that works rather, should follow our salvation. They absolutely should. Now, now, look, now, now I agree with that. I think, okay. that. I think what we differ is that out of obedience of that faith, the works that I perform is in accordance to what we find in what's called the statute of laws commandments, because that's the measurement for what is good. Paul said that the law is holy. It's set apart, that it's good and it's spiritual. So if the law is spiritual, it's good and holy. This is Paul's yeah. work, not mine. Yeah, then that is the standard for the works because, you know, there's works contained in there. The, the work that's contained in there, my brother, is not just ritual. Right, there's moral laws in there, right? Yeah, and the laws that you do pertaining to your brother and your sister. So mm -hmm. those elements of it are the works that need to be produced from us in congruence with our faith, right? And this is what James is saying, James chapter two. But let me check it out. Did you mention about Cornelius? Romans chapter two, verse five of uh, twenty-five says, "For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision." Right? Check it out. So if a man who is uncircumcised, this is Cornelius, keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? This is why Peter said what he said, why the Most High had to open Peter's mind up so he can go to Cornelius, because mm -hmm. what we just said about Cornelius is in conjunction with what we see here. He was doing the same works that a person who had the law should be doing, but he mm -hmm. happened to do it without having the law. So there is still a measurement or some kind of barometer, some kind of meter to measure what those good works are. Because if you just say good works, I mean, that's relative to anybody. Somebody can say, okay, well, I gave somebody $20. Is that a good work? You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, I went ahead and, and, and saluted my neighbor after I had an attitude with them. Is that a good work? How do you define those good works? What is the measuring stick for defining what those good works are? Very good. I'm glad you asked the question. Mm -hmm. The scriptures are, are, and I agree in this aspect that the law taught us the righteousness of God. I'm talking even under the Mosaic law, we see the righteousness of God there. However, let's go back to your verse in Genesis chapter 26, verse number five. Ab you, Abraham didn't keep the Mosaic law. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't 
similarities or there weren't, I'm, I'm sure Abraham didn't murder. And, and that was also a command of the Mosaic law, but there's nothing in scripture that would tell us that Abraham kept the Shabbat. There's nothing in scripture that would tell us that Abraham kept any dietary laws. There's nothing in scripture that tells us that Abraham kept Passover. We know he didn't keep Passover. Did, did, because did pa Abraham, wait, did Abraham sacrifice animals? Yes or no? Yes. Did, did he know what was clean and unclean? Cause you know, that language, no, 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 no. wait, wait, wait. That, that is scribal language from a priest. Did he know what was unclean and clean? Yes or no? Right. What we'll remember the unclean distinctions in terms of that which was edible didn't come to the Levitical priesthood. So the what, un, wait, wait, there, there was an unclean. There was an unclean in Genesis that had to do with what was acceptable for sacrifice and what was not. But when it came, because remember, after Noah, we can go there, right? In in, in Genesis chapter number nine, I believe it is, mm -hmm. when Noah left the ark, God told him that every living creature was given to him for meat. And so so the there's a difference in terms mm -hmm. uh in, that you want the unclean that's mentioned when Noah was putting animals on the ship, I believe it's Tahir, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. the Hebrew word Tahir mm -hmm. oh, uh -huh. is not the same word that's given in Leviticus. So there was a there was a system that that let them know what animals were accepted for sacrifice mm -hmm. that were considered clean and unclean. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about the 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 edible unclean and unclean that did not come into play until the Levitical priesthood. Okay. So when we see a situation where Abraham circumcised, is circumcision in the law? Yes. Was Abraham circumcised? Yes. Did he circumcise his blood relatives and the strangers in his household? Absolutely. So circumcision is contained in the law and Moses performed that, correct? Absolutely. Remember what I said, that, 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 that laws murder was wrong from day one mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm, mm -hmm. murder was wrong from day one and therefore that law would transcend uh, for lack of a better term i like the term mm -hmm. dispensation and when i use the term dispensation just simply means to an epoch of time where god dispenses his judgment his mercy and his in his rules mm -hmm. and so those things transcend under the Noahic covenant. Murder was still wrong, although although there was not a Mosaic covenant. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Under the Adamic covenant, murder was still wrong, although there was not a Mosaic covenant. And mm -hmm. so, just because circumcision was under the Abrahamic covenant, and it's also under the Mosaic covenant, it would be a fallacy of equivocation to say, therefore, all of the Mosaic laws must have been those that were kept under the Abrahamic covenant. That would be wrong for us to do that, and we have no biblical basis to make that uh, uh, dial that connection rather okay so let's go back to genesis chapter 26 and verse 5 right yes sir so let me ask you a question is it your position that moses wrote the book of genesis absolutely okay was moses a levite moses was a levite yes was his brother aaron a levite absolutely and through the loins of aaron was that the levitical priesthood came through uh, there? yes okay so if moses is the one that's writing this down and he's a levite his mm -hmm. brother Aaron is a Levite, and there's mm -hmm. a bunch of Levites. Would you would you also subscribe that there were scribes amongst them? Because in order for you to write something, you have to have some kind of scribal knowledge, right? Well, well, we'll see. Hold on for a sec. No, sure. Remember, mm -hmm. the law came by Moses, but but if we understand that the context, the law was passed down through oral tradition. They didn't have the writing the writing tools in printing distributions that we have today, and so Moses, Aaron, the Levites. Uh, passed the law down through oral tradition. It still came by Moses. The revelation came by Moses, but but the law primarily was passed down through oral tradition, which is why even the Ten Commandments was given, so so we could understand God's law even on the ten fingers, and and so they're they're uh, uh, they they relate to one another, so they they can be remembered because they didn't have books or libraries or websites that they could go to. So the law was 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 passed down through oral tradition. So, so let's 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 we're gonna stop there for one second all right sure. so the oral so there's believed to be an oral law right that Absolutely. was kept by the pharisees okay and then was codified in the mishnah through the sahedrin rulings right and then commentated on by sages in babylon that created the talmud and sages that was also in jerusalem that created the jerusalem talmud that is not the same thing as the written elements that we find no i agree with that wait so check it out so when we go to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26, it says mm -hmm. something very interesting, right? It mm -hmm. says, um, 
uh, take this book, the word Sefer, of the law. It's a book. That means somebody wrote something in it. Mm -hmm. And put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. So according to the narrative, somebody mm -hmm. wrote something in a scroll, because this is a linguistic gloss. Books didn't exist back then. They had scrolls, mm -hmm. right? Or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or vellum. Yeah. Right, or they could use goat skin, but whatever it was, it was something in a scroll format that somebody wrote something on, rolled it up, and placed it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. So something was written by somebody yeah. according to this, right? And I agree with you there. And there are a couple of different takes on that. And one of them is that God Himself, who wrote with His finger, hello, that's, that's the Ten Commandments, my brother. I'm talking about the book and the side of the law that Moses wrote. Let me show you where it says right. that Moses wrote that book. What, 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 I was just giving you both the takes. Now, I okay. agree with you. Verse 24, you can read. Uh, you, I'll read that after you're done. Go ahead. Right, right. So my point is, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there was no right, but I, what I'm saying is that law still had to be passed down orally because, that. remember, my point was that it was not, we didn't have the printing process oh, that we saying. have today. You're yeah. So you're saying, like, you're saying like the common person wouldn't have had it. On a scroll that they would be taking with themselves. Absolutely. Okay, and that would make sense because in Deuteronomy chapter six, it tells Israelites are being commanded to keep this law, and as they go, as they come, as they lie down, as they, as they wake up, to teach it diligently to your children, to put it on your doorposts. Okay, I understand what you mean by that. But what I was alluding to was the fact that there was a written scroll of the statutes, laws, and commandments that was done by Moses. That's why I asked you, do you believe that Moses was the author? of Genesis. Yes. He's a Levite. Okay. So if you believe he's the author of Genesis, you say mm -hmm. he's a Levite and we say that Aaron is, a, is also a Levite and through the mm -hmm. lineage of Aaron and other Levites, they become the priesthood. And mm -hmm. then we go to verse 24 in chapter 31 of Deuteronomy and it says when Moses had finished writing the words. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that Moses wrote. The, I, I the agree with law. that. Okay. In a book to the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the ark of the coming of the Lord to take this book. So okay. Moses wrote it according to the Agreed. narrative, right? Agreed. And it was, and he rolled it up. He gave it to the Levites. Yo, put it on the side of the ark. They put it on the side of the ark, right? So now, if we believe that he also authored the book of Genesis, the language, the scribal language that'll be written there should look like something from the style of a, let's say, a Levitical priest during the time of Moses. It should look like that. It shouldn't mm -hmm. look like anything like the book of Job, which is more archaic. It should look like something that comes from during that time period in which the book of Leviticus is written, Exodus is written, Deuteronomy. It should look like that, right? Would you mm -hmm. agree? Absolutely. Okay. I, I'm, okay. So if it should look like that, that means if they're using terms to describe certain things in the book of Genesis, it will possibly be from the outlook of a Levitical scribe who's writing this down, whether it's Moses or somebody wrote it on behalf of Moses who's writing this down. The reason why I say this, Elder, is because when we go back to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5, all of those things he's mentioned there are things that we've seen thematically written in what we call the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deut Deuteronomy, as far as charges, mm -hmm. statutes, commandments, etc. Now, I can give you an example of that if you want to, if you want to know what I'm talking about. So what, what I'm saying is the illusion from whoever's writing it down is that Moses, right, and writing this down, the knowledge he's receiving. It's saying that Abraham, in some way, shape, or form, again, like you said, it's not fully outlined like we have the book of the law, but he's Absolutely. keeping some statutes, he's keeping some charges, he's keeping some commandments, and it's the same words that are being used throughout the rest of the Torah to explain more specific things that we find in the law, right? I mean, I, I'm with you. I, I'm just not sure how you're making that connection. Go ahead. No, I mean, I don't, I, I'm saying because because as you said, and Moses doing the writing, mm -hmm. then and and that's important, right, to understand. Yeah. Which is why Moses would have used the same words then, right? See, something that was ceremonially, uh, ceremonially unclean, that word tahor, mm -hmm. was different from tame, and so Moses, Moses, who wrote the books of the law, right? Mm -hmm. Moses uses a different word that came into effect under once the Levitical priesthood came into effect, mm -hmm. then what was used when it referred all the way back to Noah's time. And so if, and, and so it being the same author adds to my argument, mm -hmm. the, the validity that we have no scripture and there is none. It, it's, it's speculation at best and a bad one to say that 
Abraham would have had to keep all of the laws and statutes that were given under the Mosaic Covenant. As a matter of fact, under the law, God tells uh, the children of Israel through Moses, he says that this law and covenant that I'm making with you today, I did not make this with your forefathers. And so this yes, was Deuteronomy. It's obviously a different covenant because it's a different situation. But it was, remember, Deuteronomy was the repeating of the law. That covenant was based on the laws and statutes that were given at Mount Sinai, which is why, which is so important here as we get into the new covenant. And because Paul makes it clear that the Sinai covenant symbolically represents Hagar in Galatians chapter number four. He represents Hagar, who was in the home for a season. And Hagar represented the, the covenant of the flesh, which represented Mount Sinai, which persecuted Isaac, who was the child of promise. Je and Paul equates that with the Judaizers who were persecuting Christians for not keeping the Sinai covenant. And what did Paul say? Paul used this and point it back to Genesis. And Paul would have understood the law in Genesis a lot better than any of us. He points back and say, these things are uh, uh, allegory. And Paul says, what does the scripture say? And Paul quotes Genesis and says, like, what's the verse again? What's uh, the verse? In, in Galatians, let's go there. Galatians yeah. chapter four. This, mm -hmm. is, this is good, good to go here. So I'm glad you asked me to go here. Galatians chapter four, because mm -hmm. I'd rather read it than quote it. Okay. Because it's, Galatians chapter four, watch this, starting mm -hmm. at verse number, let's see here, 21, watch this, tell me, oh, you who, can you put it on the screen so that everybody, oh can, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry, I should put it on the screen, thank you, okay. I'll certainly do that, here we go, All right. watch this, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law, for it was written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And he of the free woman, oh, I'm sorry, I click on a word to take you somewhere else. And he of the free woman through promise. Watch this, which things are symbolic? KJV says uh, allegorical, right? For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, okay. which gives birth to bondage, mm -hmm. which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai. Now, we all know what covenant was given on Mount Sinai. It was the so, law. So what kind of literary device are we looking at here? What do you mean? The literary device. So when he says, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai. So is Hagar actually a mountain? No, this is this is hyperbole. This is an allegory. This is uh, allegory. Oh, this wait, is allegory. But, but remember mean, though, it's it, he still removed the concrete meaning. Of course, I, she's not a mountain, right? Of course. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> but 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 he's bringing out something very important here, and he's going to give us the spiritual clarity. He's going to give it to us. I don't even have to add to it. He could Hagar allegorically is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which corresponds to Jerusalem, which now he is and is in bondage with her children. So he's making a distinction from Mount Sinai and the Jerusalem, which was is above and is free, right? Which is mother of us all. Now watch what he goes on to say. For it is written, rejoice, O barren. He's quoting the scriptures here, right? This is Isaiah 54. He's quoting, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now watch verse 28. Mm -hmm. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, the persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Watch verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with son of the free woman now we've already established that hagar is the bondwoman who corresponds keep clicking the wrong thing here to mount sinai and she is to be cast out because the law was only until faith would come and paul makes that clear 
And so the law and faith does not correspond together. We're talking about the Sinaitic covenant. Now, that's why I'm glad you brought up those other passages because we aren't lawless. The true born again believer applies the righteous nature of the law in his life as we are led by the spirit. Galatians 5 tells us not to be led by the flesh and it lives 17 different works of the flesh. But Hagar, the law, the Sinaitic covenant, that has to be cast out. Wait, so now, wait, so now, now slow ahead, down there. Go ahead, go ahead. Slow down there. So there was another point I want to get back to, but since we're sure. here, I want to stay here, okay? Sure. So you would agree that this is Paul making this hermeneutical uh, assess assessment, right? Yeah, so he's is... the one that's looking at these two things. He's creating this allegory where he's taking two things figuratively, right? He talks about the literal meaning. He gives a figurative meaning, and he's using that in order for him to teach what he's sharing with the Galatians, correct? Yeah, I would just add one thing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Paul's sure campaign, correction, yeah, of course. Chosen by Christ <laughs> so, himself. Correct. <laughs> So, so yes, now, under so the inspiration now. of the Holy Spirit, because this is scripture. Okay, now would you say that he is writing this after the event that occurs in Acts chapter 15, as we see in Galatians chapter 2? Yeah. Okay, so the issue he was having during that period of time was with what sect of believers? Judaizers. <laughs> oh, you talking about what? Pharisees, the, right? Well, there were, there were uh, some of the sect of the Pharisees who believe that they must, the Gentiles must continue to keep the Mosaic law and be circumcised. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just the Pharisees. And there's, the text doesn't say that at no, all. It does, it does say it was the Pharisees. The sects of the Pharisees were the one that were really pushing for that. So well, you go to Acts chapter 15. Yeah, we yeah, go there Acts Acts because okay. before the sect of the Pharisees, it, on their way to Jerusalem, they ran into the sect of the Pharisees, but the dispute came before that happened. The dispute, which is why they were on their way to Jerusalem to resolve the matter, and we can uh, let me show you that. Yeah, so it. yeah, so um, it says, and uh, but some men came down from Judea, yes. where the Pharisees were at, and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now these right. are these were not people that were just with them; they came down from Judea, absolutely, wherever Paul and Barnabas was at. So so let's yeah. keep going. And after they had Therefore, no further debate, Paul and Barnabas, some of them others were appointed to go to Jerusalem, right? Now, we exactly. keep reading, it says, So being sent. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep reading. And then if we keep going down to verse 5, you'll see it reiterated. It says, But some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them to order them to keep the law of Moses. So now if we look at verse one, where the beep happened at in Judea, the, excuse me, the Judeans, people who were living in Judea, was coming down and they encountered Paul and Barnabas. It was like, yo, these guys got to be circumcised according to Moses or they can't be saved. Then it says when they came to Jerusalem, because the Jerusalem was in Judea, it says, but some believers who belong to the party, the Pharisees rose up and they said the same thing. So the influence is coming from the sect of the Pharisees who were believers that were amongst the greater believers that were there in Jerusalem. Well, right? I mean, I mean, I don't think this is a major issue. I think that the, the distinction of them being Pharisees is not given to us when the dispute initially happened. You say the influence may have come from the Pharisees. I won't fall out about that particular point. Okay. We do see that once they share their testimony in verse number four, mm -hmm. some of the sect of the Pharisees who believe rose up. So so I, this seems to be distinct okay. even to what happened in verse number one and two. So, so the reason why I'm bringing it up it's because it's in relation to what you were saying, right? And that is to say that the issue that Paul was having when we see Galatians being written is the excessive adherence of the law or the legalism of the law that was mm -hmm. entrapping the believers, okay? Because you said the law was up until when? When did the law like stop becoming uh, relevant? Well, no, no. The law, oh, I'm sorry. I'm hitting the wrong, wrong button here. The law was until faith, the covenant specifically, not till nobody had faith, but according to the scripture, right? I'm quoting here, went until faith. But now that faith has come, the law, which was our tutor or our schoolmaster, we're no longer under that schoolmaster. So when That's you say right under, here. you mean keep the law, right? Under means that we are under the obligation to follow all of its tenets. All of his tenants. Where so, when you're so, under 
So my okay. wife is under the law of our marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as the head of the home, she is responsible for submitting to me. And I'm under some laws as well, <laughs> right? <laughs> submitting to me. And, that she might be right, listening. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> Love you, honey. No, <laughs> but no. So uh -huh. she's under some, you know. She's, but if I'm dead, once I die, she mm -hmm. is loose from my law. If she, if she remarries after I die, mm -hmm. right? She doesn't have to say, "Well, my." But Mike didn't like the chicken cooked this way, right? right. Mike didn't like it this way. Mm -hmm. Now that she no longer it has to abide by that, although it was binding while her and I were married, mm -hmm. and so. The fact that we are no longer under the law, we're not legalistically bound to the tenets of the Mosaic Covenant. So wait, so if that's the case, and Paul wrote this yes. in Acts around the time of Acts 15, when we mm -hmm. get to Acts 21, why is Paul keeping the law? Remember, the, the whole point isn't that a Jewish person did not keep laws or that any Christians for that matter didn't keep laws. The point of not being under the law is that you're not legalistically bound because Timothy submitted to circumcision for the sake of the Jewish brethren in the area that he was going to be ministering in. But Titus being a Greek was like, nah, I'm good on that. So, so it's not that you know, you're going to find people and especially an Israelite who was raised uh, keeping these customs, many of them will continue to keep them for the duration of their life. And there's nothing wrong so long for uh -huh. a believer that you understand that you're not legalistically bound. You're not under these laws. So wait, and so, so to see Paul keeping the law don't, don't prove that he had to or was legalistically oh, bound wait, to. Wait, wait, wait. So prove, wait, I love that. Keep that, keep that right there, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It, First, yeah, Corinthians, yeah. Chapter right verse, First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, right? Uh -huh. so, so Paul saying this to the church at Corinth, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let's keep that in mind. That's important, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to break that down. Wait, wait, Paul kept the Sabbath. He went to the Sabbath reason with the Jews in the synagogues every Sabbath. Paul went to Jerusalem to go keep the feast, right? And now Paul's proven in Acts 21 after encountering James and the other elders because they had to check Paul. So, yo, Paul, we're hearing a lot of things about you with the Gentiles. Man, this is awesome. However... There's some rumors going around where you're teaching the Jews amongst the Gentiles that they are not to keep the law. They're not to be circumcised. They're not to keep the law. He said, what are we going to do about this, Paul? See, see, this, this, is the no, thing that, yeah. this is the thing that's important. And it says here, and this is verse 20, uh, you see, brother, how many thousands that are among the Jews of those who I believe that are zealous for the law. Now, if somebody's zealous for the law, what does that mean? Like me, I'm zealous for the law. What does that mean when somebody's zealous for the law? They were, uh, a person who is zealous for the law is a person who uh, is trying to keep the law. Let me just, long, long story awesome. short. Keep that. I like that. And okay. they have been told about you, Paul. Yes. Yes. You teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to what? Forsake Moses. You know, when somebody says, well, now that faith has come, you know, that old bond. No, no. Wait, wait, wait. Hagar, put her out. Now we walk in faith. We walk under the laws of Christ, right? No, no, no that's a bad interpretation. Bad interpretation. Okay. Yeah. So maybe you can explain to me what you mean, what, what it means here to you when it says, right. you, were, you taught the Jews, this is what they're hearing, who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise the children or walk according to our customs. Now, you have exactly. to- and, and ooh, I'm glad you read the end of that verse. Yeah, I'm glad you read the end of that verse. Watch it because it notice what he said. Paul never taught anybody that they had to forsake the law and no longer keep their Israelite customs. That he never taught that. That's understanding that when Paul is speaking in Galatians, he's talking spiritual value. Because remember, in Galatians chapter 5, around verse number 2, he says, If you are circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. He still had Timothy circumcised though. He was still circumcised, but he understood from a spiritual aspect, a spiritual aspect, there is no value that adds to your spirituality. So why are you circumcised? Anybody Paul there? circumcised Timothy, the text tells us, because of the Jews in that region, and he understood that that was a roadblock get, get, for get, them. Get, get, it, get, it never said wait, that he wait, circumcised Timothy get, according get, to the law. Acts 16, and show me in Acts 16 where it says what you just said. 
No, he no, did no. because of the Wait Jews in that region. Get it no, no, no. I said he circumcised Timothy because yeah, of the because Jews. That's what I said. Give me that. Give me what you Oh, that's saying. in there. Oh, yeah, that's in there. Where it says that he did oh, it because yeah. of the Jews. Oh, you watch it. That. It's in cool. there. All right. Let me, that's let me go. I'm, uh -huh. I'm going to go here. Watch this here. Let me share my screen. Mm hmm Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Let me. All right, here we go. All right, let's see this. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek, well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So he was already well spoken of by the brethren, being uncircumcised. Yeah, keep, keep going. I'm going. I'm, I'm gonna, I just, oh yeah, I want you to you break. Know, it down, you know right? the, the the preacher stopped and he preached a little and he read. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to get that in you. Go ahead. <laughs> Paul wanted to have him go on with him. Okay. And he took him and circumcised him mm -hmm. because. Keep going. Uh -huh. Of the Jews. Uh -huh. Who were in that region? Uh -huh. They all knew that his father was a Greek. Now explain uh -huh. that. Explain that. I think it's self-explanatory. No, no, he's no. Wait, he's circumcised because his father. Not because was of the Greek. law, not to be obedient to Moses, not to keep customs of traditions. So why do he do it? Because the text is clear right because, here. Because, because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So then why why is he being circumcised if that's the case listen be, because of the jews see paul let me show you and, and i can bring out the, the clarity here yeah. paul says in, in first corinthians chapter 9 let me show you this right here mm -hmm. this is this is paul's um uh mode of mode of operation here okay. in first corinthians 9 starting around verse number 20 watch what paul 20? does okay, go ahead Watch this. And to the Jews, I became a Jew. Oh, I knew he was going to go there. That I might win Jews. Yeah, to but those this who are under about the about law, that. as yeah. under the law, that I might win those under the law. But this is talking about a Greek, not Paul, who is a Jew. It's talking about a right. Greek who was circumcised. Right, but who had him circumcised? Paul. To those without law, watch what Paul says. He became to those without law as without law. Not being without law toward God, but under the law toward Christ. Look at the distinction that I might win those who are without law. And so this is this is the whole point of ministry. And this is why Paul even said in Corinthians about those who who uh, are still offended by certain foods that were offered to idols. He said, listen, if meat caused your brother to offend, don't eat no meat. Don't don't even eat. Why? Because if meat caused your brother to offend, you know, don't wound your brother's weak conscience. And so it's clear in the text why Timothy was circumcised. OK, so now so, so, then, so you agree that Paul is doing things circumstantially. Yeah, there's no it, it, there was no spiritual obligation for Timothy to be circumcised. Wait, wait. So there's no threat of consistency because Acts 15 was beefing because they said the Gentiles have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And in Acts 15. In Acts 16, he goes and he gets Timothy circumcised after they just had a council about circumcision in the previous chapter. So you're saying Absolutely. Paul is just being circumstantial. That means, okay, if this situation arises and I could be lawless, I'm going to be lawless. Wait. This okay, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Notice what you just, you use the term called lawless. We aren't under the law. You you, you can't be lawless if if the speed limit is, is not 35, mm -hmm. if it's 60. You, you don't have to go 35. So you're not lawless by going 40 or 50 if the speed limit is 60, right? You're only lawless if the speed limit is 35 and you decide to violate and you don't think you have to keep the law that's set where the, the law of Moses is no longer set. Now, you can volitionally, as a Jew, you can decide that I am going to, this is and I'm, why I'm glad you read the rest of that verse in, in, in uh, Acts chapter number 21, because he says, we heard that you're teaching people to forsake the customs. That's not what Christians do. You, as an Israelite, you can keep the customs of your culture and there's no, there's no sin in that. There's no sin in keeping a cultural practice. However, however, go ahead. 
when you try to attribute that to one's salvation or to add any spiritual merit, now you are imposing upon the death and the fullness of the sufficiency of what Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. And then Paul says, you have fallen from grace now. So then, so then, if the if the key if the key proponent of this is the law, then why should anybody keep the law? Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. Nobody should be keeping the law. Then, right? Listen, because the you law, said bondage. Well, wait, wait. So when you, read, when you read when you read Galatians in regards right. to Hagar representing the bondwoman, yes. and that you said she represents Jerusalem. That's the text says Jerusalem, and you're saying that's the law, right? And you're saying that. Paul, I, mean, maybe, I don't want to, I don't, I'm trying to recollect what you said because we said so many things since then. Right, 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 right. You were saying that that was, that Hagar was put away and you said that represents us putting aside the law. Is that what you're saying? Here's, here's when it, as it pertains to the covenantal relationship with God, okay. this was the whole point. As it pertains to the covenantal relationship with God, Hagar and Ishmael, couldn't would not get the inheritance that Isaac would get. As a matter of fact, even Abraham didn't want to put Ishmael in, in Hagar out. But mm -hmm. God said, listen to your wife, put the woman out for mm -hmm. the son of and for the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So the allegory was that the law was the work of the flesh allegorically was Hagar when, when Abraham and Sarah, after their own efforts, tried to fulfill the promise through their own works. Mm -hmm. And Ishmael was born as a product of that union. So but it, I, I Isaac was a child of the promise uh -huh. who was born of faith. Was of it, did, faith. Any, wait, did any works come from that? Because you know he was asked to sacrifice Isaac. Did any works come from that? Yes, which I've already established that faith follow. I mean, works follow our faith. So we're not against works, my brother. We are against works righteousness. That's what we're against. So works do not produce righteousness. Even though I went over and said mm -hmm. works meet for repentance and going to do performing works in alignment with your repentance, work is a form of obedience. So, for example, you said that something was very clear. You said that... Uh, the situation with um, Ishmael was that Abraham and Isaac did a work outside of what they were commanded to do, correct? Exactly. Okay. So, well, so not, 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 not so much what they command were commanded to do outside of God's purposes, because what they decided was that Ishmael would be the child of promise. But that was but that was in their own flesh, right? Exactly. So now if I decide that I'm going to keep the law out of obedience to the word of the Most High, now I didn't write the Torah, right? You just mm -hmm. also mentioned that God took his finger, put the commandments there, and then told Moses, write this book of the law. So if I'm being obedient to the law, those are not my words. That's not something outside of myself. I mean, outside of the law, this is something that the Most High commanded the children of Israel and it was elements of it that was a perpetual covenant, one of them being what you see here, right here on my shirt, a perpetual covenant for right. those to know. So so, so I would liken that not to the situation out now. This is, I guess this is me getting into um, dealing with Paul's theology, right? Because Paul has a very distinct theology because of his audience, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, he takes the liberty to make these kind of figurative statements to try and get them to understand things because they would have to have some kind of semblance of knowing the law in order to know what Paul's talking about. Otherwise, he'd have to retell the whole story. So that means the people there that he was talking to knew some stuff about the law because they were encountering the Judaizers, right? In, in the regulations. Okay. So I would liken it to if the Mosai tells me or commanded my forefathers to do A, B, C, F, and G, if I go outside that scope, then I'm doing things out of my own flesh, out of my own works of righteousness. However, if I get back in alignment with that, if I repent, and turn back in alignment with that, and I'm doing it out of obedience. Not because I'm saying, well, I'm better than you, Elder Mike. I'm doing it out of right. obedience of my faith because mm -hmm. this is what the Most High entrusted the children of Israel, and it was his expectation in their exile, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1, that mm -hmm. they will return back to it, teach it to the kids so that they may live and that he may take them and bring them back into the land. This is perpetual. It didn't stop once they broke well, the commandments and was dispelled. It, it continued on. 
Well, I think I think yes. so. I think you made some good points in that. I understand the heart of what you're saying. You're not seeking to 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 make it about the law. I hear you, right? But I I still think that there's there there could potentially be uh, some issues there. We aren't obligated to keep the customs of the Mosaic law. That's the point. The principles that were taught to us in the law transcend under grace. And therefore, the born again believer, he lives out those principles in his daily life. And so and so there were things such as the sacrificial laws, right? Those are called axioms, right? Universal okay. truths. Exactly. Right. But, right, exactly. Right. But but remember, and even you use the term perpetual, that even has to be understood in this context, because you want to know what else that word perpetual is referenced even under the old covenant was the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic line. That same word perpetual was used to describe their ministry in and the it, old covenant. But, but it didn't speak because it's going to be restored. You know that, right? Absolutely not. Whoa. It will not. No, wait, 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 that's, a, that's wait, eschatology, wait, though. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, let you go. No, let you go. No, absolutely <laughs> not. I do not believe that any of <laughs> Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. We will not slay no more lambs uh, and sprinkle no more blood uh, for no sin sacrifice. It's not happening. That's just not happening. And no, I reject that outright. I I, I think that's a, a misunderstanding. But but back to the topic, maybe that's why you know it almost maybe I shouldn't even make the point now because you think that that. Aaronic line is perpetual is when perpetual. the Hebrew writer, if you accept one of them, Hebrew, like Isaiah, but go ahead. Yeah, but remember, old covenant uh letters have to be understood through new covenant lenses because guess what? Ephesians chapter number three, guess what? That these some things were not revealed to the prophets or or men of other ages as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets and so though they were speaking to an immediate cultural context of people those words may have applied to them contextually and in their current environment one way but the eschatological fulfillment can take on a different nuance that wasn't seen in their immediate construct and yeah, that's, that's what right that's why the new right testament I, 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 no, no, I'm saying you said that like point for point out of the systematic theological textbook. I, oh, I, God, I, God, that, was no, that was the Bible I was just preaching. That. No, 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 I'm, no. I'm saying I'm not saying that you literally read it. I'm just saying that that comes right out of that type of textbook, right? Um, so then, if that's the case, when we look when we look towards the future time, so you're saying that now that Christ came, modifications was made. To promises mm -hmm. that were given to Israel through yeah. the prophets. Not my I wouldn't use the word modifications. I would use the term greater fulfillment, right? So okay. under the under the under the patriarchal times, you know, your Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and even before them, uh, where you had Adamic covenant along with the Noahic covenant, mm -hmm. there was a certain amount of light given. Progressively under the law, when it came through Moses, guess what? More light was given. You know, Moses began to prophesy in Deuteronomy 18 about a prophet like unto him that God would raise up, right? We understand that in the new covenant, Stephen preaches in Acts chapter number seven, <laughs> that this prophet that Moses talked about in Deuteronomy 18 was in fact the Christ that God had raised up to be both Lord and Christ. And so revelation is progressive. And as time went on, more understanding and clarity is given. So I wouldn't use the term modification. I would use the term illumination. As time goes on, more understanding of those prophecies is given. It's not a modification. God isn't changing anything. He's opening up our understanding to clearly understand what those prophecies in their full fullness actually mean. Can you can you just show what I have up there real quick? You should, okay, yeah, sure. All right. So Isaiah 66, is this an eschatological text talking about the end times? Yes. Okay. So if that's the case and we scroll mm -hmm. down here yeah. to verse uh, verse 60 i'll read it for context for I, uh, verse 18 for i know their works and their thoughts and at the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues right right and they shall come and shall see my glory and i will right. set a sign among them and from mm -hmm. them i will send survivors to the nation of tarshish pull lud 
who draw the bow to bull and Yavan to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Check mm -hmm. this out. And they shall bring all your brothers because proper exegesis is identified as speaking audience. So here, Church who's the speaker? Is well, what a speaker is God through Isaiah. And who's the audience? Israel. So who is Israel's brothers? Are the Israelites, right? Absolutely. Okay. From all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots and in litters and on mules and in dromedaries to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering the clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And some of them I will take for priests and for Levites. Now, why is this happening if the Levitical priesthood is done? You can all keep right, I'm, Yeah, sure. Sure. I'm going to answer you have the new earth, right? That's ushering going transition into the new heavens and new earth. So please explain that that point right there. So that's kind of yeah. No problem at all. And I just wanted to honor. Thank you, KB, for the uh, super chat. He says, and I'm gonna answer your question in just a second. But he says, is Mike saying that walking in the spirit, then we automatically do the law, the law of Christ? I would absolutely say uh, yes. In other words, people who are led by the spirit fulfill the righteousness of the law. That's Romans chapter eight, verse number four. Now to answer uh, divine prospects. Uh, uh, question regarding the eschatological uh, end time prophecy where it talks about some of them I will take as priests and things of that nature. So this is why prophecy is is so uh, uh, interesting, right? And, and, and prophecy must be understood in the proper light. And as you brought out, and I agree with, the first thing we must understand is the contextual, uh, uh, the contextual paradigm of the text. And so to do that, we identify the audience. Israel was the audience. Who was Israel? Israel, God's elect people under the old covenant during the time of the prophecy under the law when the Levitical priesthood was still in play, right? Still in play and, and the Levitical priesthood was still in full effect. And therefore, when we see in the new covenant, the fulfillment of this, because here's where I would challenge you. I would challenge you then to go to Revelation where we see even a greater light of the fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah spoke and, and show me a Levitical priesthood. You won't be able to do that. Why? Because when prophecy is given, it's given to the immediate audience in the language and customs that are understood by the audience receiving the message okay. and so in the new covenant we understand that those priests that he speaks of are not limited to a levitical priesthood but as peter declares he has made us the believers that are made up of both jew and gentile a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And so when we read Old Testament prophecy, and prophecy is always obscure until fulfillment. When you read Old Testament prophecy, that's good now, but we also have to see how the New Covenant, New Testament writers refer to those prophecies and what light they refer to them in. We now, are kings and priests before the lord i'm gonna answer that so first of all we don't have any reference and the new testament shedding light on this passage so anything that is spoken about what they may mean is speculative the second thing i'll say is i agree once the temple was destroyed the levitical priesthood could not perform their duties anymore so there was a contingency plan and we see that in the book of hebrews right that is the mechizedek order the mechizedek order the high priest of that is yeshua or jesus and those who believe in him are part of that order of priests, which is the fulfillment of Exodus chapter 19, verse six, where it says that I will make you a kingdom of priests. So that's our job. But the priest's job is to be the one to mediate or bring a person to God. That's the priest's job, to mediate when there's some kind of sin or some kind of issue so that a person can get right with the creator. That's the priest's job. Okay. If they're giving this message from Yeshua and they're going out into the world, they're acting as a priest after the order of Melchizedek in the same vein that Yeshua was performing it in the heavenly realm. He's, okay. he's in the, the holies of holies, but we're here as priests in his stead, representing him as his witnesses, like he says in Acts chapter one. And then we're the ones going out to the lost and bringing them back to the creator by means of Yeshua. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? 
I disagree. Okay. And, but I disagree because of the initial point. Now, there are aspects of it I, I could certainly agree with in that, that we're priests, that we go out and we represent the Lord. But mm -hmm. but you started out by saying that that it was a contingency plan. It was. It, no, no, Christ was the, the Christ. The, the true high priest is not a contingency plan. He is the plan. The Levitical priesthood was a type in the shadow of Christ. The, the, the Melchizedek priesthood through Christ is what's eternal. And that was no... Uh, what, is a, what is a contingency plan, Elder Mike? Well, a contingency plan is typically something that uh, is put in place in in case something goes wrong with the initial right. plan. Let's, let's be, that's that's what what wrong. wrong. That's wrong, exactly wrong, wrong. <laughs> no, it's not. No, no, it's not. And I'm gonna tell you why. The first problem you have is that the verses that you quoted from Hebrews were written while the temple was still standing. So once Christ died, listen, they could have offered all them animals that they sacrificed meant nothing. Once Christ died and was resurrected from the grave, none of even though the temple was still standing, none of that meant a thing. And I'm gonna show you that right here. In Hebrews, because remember, Hebrews was written pre AD 7, yeah. and this is Hebrews chapter number uh, 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 seven, verse starting mm -hmm. at verse number 11. Watch this, he says real clearly here that if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood mm -hmm. or under it, people received the law, mm -hmm. what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh. Read that. Wait, wait, wait. Read that. Oh, one more time. That's a contingency plan. Read it one more time. That, ain't, that is not a contingency. But I'm gonna show you this. It's, it's so clear here. Okay. It, he's yeah. number one. He's telling you that perfection don't come from the Levitical priesthood. He says if it did, there wouldn't be a need for another. No, I agree with it, that. It, it had, nothing, it had okay. nothing to do with the fact that the temple was still standing or not. Whether the temple could be standing today. Perfection would still not come through the Levitical priesthood. And he said, if it did, watch this, because it's going to get even better. If it. it did, there would be no need for Melchizedek. Wait, wait, no, right? no, no. What further need was there that another priest should rise? So wait a second. If I said that somebody's a priest now, but something was imperfect about it, therefore another priest should rise. If you go into the Greek, look in the tense, Elder Mike. This is not oh, saying yeah. that this another is oh, always, whoa, 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 wait. It's not saying this another has always been there. It came about because of the failure of the covenant at Sinai that there was, the, the, the those that was entrusted to did not keep it. Therefore, another covenant had to arise. Another priesthood had to arise as a contingency plan because the Most High will continuously have priests that is before him. He's going to continue to keep his word like we see in the book of Jeremiah. I was going to bring that up as well. But now this new priesthood is the order of Melchizedek that believers of Yeshua enter into. And now we are fulfilling Exodus chapter 19 and 6, where now we become the priests. No, on no, no. No, I, I think that's a misunderstanding of the Greek, okay. my friend. This word heteros in Greek has reference to something being different and of another stage, something altered, something changed. And notice, and, and if you fully understand this, we understand Christ to be that lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Christ was never, ever a contingency plan. He just wasn't. He always was the plan. And the Levitical priesthood was never instituted to be an eternal priesthood, period. Christ was the eternal. He is the high priest that, that meets the needs of God and the people because he's both God and man. And so it's clear here. Now watch what he goes on to say here. He says, he okay. says he has one further yeah. need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron. Why couldn't he just raise up another Aaronic priest? Watch this in no, verse 12. There's no need to. There's no team need to. Once yeah, yesterday, there's exactly. no need to. That's why there's no need to do it again, right? Because it never perfection will never be obtained by the Levitical priesthood. So watch uh, verse number 12. Okay, well, the priesthood being changed, not delayed, not put off for a while. Ah, let me go again. Right. Priesthood being changed of necessity 
there is also a change of the law. The priesthood is in effect because the because Israel violated the law. So to change the priesthood, the laws which necessitated the priesthood have to change as well. The Hebrew writer himself is confirming the fact that we're no longer under that law that has been made obsolete. He says Mike, that in the you America, Mike. You live in America, right? Sure. Okay, so if there's a statute that's in America that that is causing issues in the land and a case is brought up and the the states brought up to the higher courts and the higher courts overturn that ordinance or that statute, right? They're actually changing what was there previously, right? Because something there was something wrong with the previous one, right? Okay. In the scenario that you're using, that's true. That's not the biblical that's not a biblical comparison, though, to what actually it takes is. place. It is, and I'm gonna show you because this is this is exactly what we're talking about in that context. Bring up my screen real quick, uh, if you don't mind, Elder Mike. Sure. Jeremiah chapter 33 and 18 says what? Can you read that? Let me uh, see it's too small. small for me. <laughs> you know, I got these glasses on. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, all right. Uh, I'll read right the New International Version here. It says, nor would the Levitical priests ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. So you said that the Levitical priesthood was never intentioned for it to be continual. Like it was never intended. And I'm telling you, yes, it was. However, when Yeshua came, there was a shift, there was a change because that was its initial purpose was to be continuously, to keep going on and on provided that Israel was obedient to the covenant. Now, when Israel disobeyed the covenant, now some changes had to be made. A modification is a change. You said there was you said that Yeshua or Jesus did not modify anything. However, we see here in the book of Hebrews that modifications and changes, you said that exact same word, occurred because of the failure to keep the covenantal promises and agreement of the forefathers of Israel. So there is a modification that occurs because of Yeshua. There is a different priesthood that exists now because of the fear of the old one while the temple was standing, and then after the temple destroyed, there's no priesthood, but the principle that there will always continuously be a priest or Levitical priest or some kind of priest before the Most High has to be consistent. And that is why the Melchizedek order is there because Yeshua offered his body as what? As a sacrifice, and it was accepted by the Most High, and now he's where? And the Holies of Holies in the heavenly tabernacle, performing a duty, and then we here on the earth are his earthly representatives of that same order of priests. That's mm. present. Now, when we get to the future, when he's physically returning, now we have another transition that occurs because he's no longer just in the heavenly realm. He's physically here on the earth. And what I'm saying is the fulfillment of what we see in the book of Isaiah happens when he physically comes back and law and orders restored according to Torah, because they're gonna be back in Jerusalem. They could be in any other city. They're going back to Jerusalem. He's gonna fight all the enemies of Israel. And from all the enemies of Israel, he's gonna reestablish everything. Everything's well, gonna be reestablished the way it was for that millennial period. Now, when you to eternity, that's different. Well, well, I, I, listen, let me say this. Let me, let me okay. stop by saying this. There are a lot of Christians who hold to a similar view that you hold, right? And mm -hmm. so some some of this eschatologically can be a secondary matter, right? I find a serious problem mm -hmm. with some reinstitution of temple sacrifice. I mean, let me, and I'm going to share my screen now in Hebrews chapter number ten. Okay. Well, Watch I'm not. This. You didn't hear me say anything about that. Now I'm talking about in the future. I'm talking future as well. Back. Right. I'm talking future as well. There is no need to go back to a Levitical priesthood, it is done, it's over. There will be no, listen, I'm not getting no lamb's blood on my white robe in the <laughs> kingdom. I'm just not doing it, we're not doing it. Oh, watch this, Hebrews 10 and 11, and every priest stands ministering daily. And, and here's another problem, and I'm just insert this before I finish reading. This book was still, uh, this, uh, 
uh, the, the temple was still standing when Hebrews was written. Correct. And he's already telling them it's over. So watch this. And every priest stands ministering daily mm -hmm. and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice. Watch this. Which can never take away sins. But we know but, that. Okay, but we, watch. We, we okay, we're going back to it for. Watch, watch verse 12. But mm -hmm. this man, talk about Jesus, talk about Yeshua. After he had offered one sacrifice for mm -hmm. sins forever. That not now, now, now this is perpetual. As a high and, priest. No, no, no. He had the high priest forever set down at the right before. hand of God. Watch that, this. Mm -hmm. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified what in the world do we have to go back to an animal sacrifice when this one sacrifice of jesus christ forever has perfected those of us who are being sanctified now we ain't going back so wait, to that so then if that's the case then then that means the several things that I'm reading to you from the prophets, you're saying has been abrogated. That's what you're telling no, me? No, I'm telling you that what you're reading from the prophets mm -hmm. must be understood in the greater fulfillment, in the greater light. So the prophets spoke within their culture to their audience in the language of the audience. Those prophecies have greater fulfillment in the new covenant and they're understood more broadly in that Christ being becomes the ultimate sacrifice that takes away the Levitical priesthood. So you can't, you cannot push an old covenant mentality into new covenant revelation. That's reading backwards into the text, the law. When we should wait, be reading, how is that reading backwards when you're reading the new covenant, quote unquote, into the old covenant? That's reading backwards. You know, remember though, remember. Let, let me read another scripture sure, here that can bring a little more clarity. Okay. Right. It, in uh here's something Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter number three. Notice what he says here. Um for this reason, I Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as i have briefly written already by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of christ watch verse five here which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets so it's clear here that there's some greater no, no, revelation. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, gonna, finish, I'm gonna finish reading. I, I'm going to. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm gonna finish reading. Okay, go ahead. There's some greater revelation though that's given here in the old covenant. You can go to the, some of them same verses that talk about Israel is mine elect, my only. I've dealt with no other nation like I've done dealt with Israel, right? But you Israel all had strangers and oh, Gentiles amongst yes. them. Yes, and Deuteronomy they, 29 yes. enters them into the covenant as well. Yeah, but they had to essentially become Israel through circumcision and keeping the law. No, no, no. That's only yes. if they want to keep Passover. That's not true. Listen, That's only no, if they want no. to keep Passover, Exodus 12. No, in order for them to enjoy full citizenship, right? Where is that? What, what, what verse is that? Wait, Where in the Bible minute. is that? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can the uncircumcised person enter into the presence of the Lord in, in the temple? But where's See, the presence of the Lord? There's an outer court for the Gentiles. So none of them will be proceeding any further than that. It's right. talking about Jews. But, but, being but we talk about we talk about being in, and I can take you right back to chapter two of the same book where, where now Gentiles are fellow citizens, fellow but, heirs. But according so, to so, so there is no they don't have to be circumcised. Here's the point, and I think you get that they don't have to be circumcised. The reason why that occurred, Elder Mike, just so you know context, is because of what occurred in the intertestamental period. A lot of changes occurred where now you have what's called excessive adherence to the law or a form of legalism that has divided the Gentile from the Jews because of the Greco-Roman rule. 
Now the Jews became more strict in dealing with Gentiles after the Greeks came on the scene. And any, I will say any scholar of the intertestamental period will tell you that, that the Jews became very leery of any kind of Gentiles and joining them. They were very particular on who they dealt with and Paul understood this. So he says, when Yeshua came, he broke that partition down because yeah. the Jews built it up. He broke yeah. it down. And in this verse that you're reading, it's a context. The mystery that you're talking about is pertaining, is, is pertaining to verse six, not everywhere else in the text. I'm going to get to the that solves it. It's just mm -hmm. talking about verse six only. I'm going to get to verse six and I'm with you yeah. there. That's why, that's why I went back and I made the reference to the the gentile listen a gentile was not on the same level as a jew as a jew if he did not embrace circumcision and keeping the law that's done away with in christ that's paul's content i'm talking about under the mosaic law you mm -hmm. could not come you, there were privileges that if you weren't circumcised you might could do this but you can't enjoy all of these benefits as over a here jew, as a jew as an israelite right an israelite right. could not i mean a, a non-israelite an uncircumcised gentile there were a lot of things that he was not able to enjoy. He was not a fellow citizen. Only, only Passover. Because if you go to Isaiah chapter fifty-six, it tells a different story there. I, I would disagree with that as well. No, it was more than just Passover. It was certain aspects of the, like you brought up, like what, like like the tap, like the court of the Gentile. They couldn't cross over into the court where the Jews were. It was a my bunch brother, of brother, no Gentile circumcised, yeah. uncircumcised can go to the inner court. None. Doesn't matter if you circumcise or not. And now, through Christ, he has broken down the middle wall. Of our physical court, my brother, that never changed. It's still the it's, consistent, right? That's why. They, that's why we don't have a physical court anymore. Which is why we're no longer under that law. Because with the Levitical priesthood being changed, there also by necessity must be change of the law. Which is the exact verse I read in Hebrews chapter number seven. With the priesthood being changed, the law changed. And so that this this is why this becomes important. So let me go on reverse six though, because you're right, right here. And then then when, that, you, when you're done, Elder Mike, I'm sorry. When you're done, you can just pull up my screen when you're done. And, and okay. I'm just asking. Okay, thank sure, you. No problem. So verse six, he says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. This is this is constitutionally different than what they had of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. We are the Gentiles are now fellow citizens, fellow heirs. There is no greater blessing for Israel. Places where Gentiles can't go, can't enter into this holy's a holy. The middle wall has been broken down. The veil of the temple was rent at Christ's death. We don't have a man in interceding for us anymore outside of Jesus Christ oh, okay. himself. Okay, okay. Because he's still interceding for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Jesus so Christ. That's why I'm man. I that clear. <laughs> And he's the Israelite on top of that, but go ahead. Yeah, he, he, that would know, right, at this point, we don't know him after the flesh. He's the God of all nations. He's the God of the world. Romans tells us, is he not only the God of the Jews or is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. So he's, yes, he is an Israelite by blood, but he's God of the world. He's creator of all things. So that, that I think that has to be understood so, as well. You see the question that Sheikah asks in there? Why did John have to measure an outer court in Revelation? Yeah. Right. She's the what, asking a question. Why is that outer court? Because that's typically for Gentiles. Well, well, uh, outer court uh, that's typically for Gentiles. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. The outer court in the book of Revelation. And there, there are a couple different takes on this. And again, I don't want to make this a big eschatological. No, 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 no. I mean, it's in Revelation chapter 11, verse 12. Right. right. So there's, there's two schools of thought there. Right. Okay. There are two schools of thought. One school of thought was that. Well, there's actually three schools of thought. One school of thought was actually that the temple was still standing. Like these are people who believe that the revelation was written pre AD 70 and that the temple was still standing at the time. No, so John, you know, you know, it was written in the late nineties before. Well, John, I'm, I'm, just giving you the of thought, right? I'm just giving you the schools of thought. I right actually down. hold the late date writing myself. So, right. so, so the first school of thought was that the temple was still standing and that revelation was written before AD 70. The second school of thought is that uh, there will be a rebuilt temple, right? And that the court's measure has, <coughs> excuse me, has reference to Gentiles that maybe get saved through during the seven year great tribulation period, right? The third school of thought is the, the school of thought that I personally lean more so towards is that this is symbolism and that John is using the language of his day to, to communicate a, a spiritual principle. That's all. 
So how do we know when to take liberty with that in interpreting the text and when it should be concrete? Well, uh, again, and I'm not, and, and I'll, I'll be clear about this too, because remember, prophecy is always obscure until fulfillment. I don't take a, a dogmatic approach. I see a, some super chats that I'm missing in questions, so I yeah. apologize, y'all. I'm gonna try to get back to some of those. I love these conversations. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, oh. no, I'm just kidding. I, I don't want to. I don't want to forsake their questions either. So I'm gonna try to scroll back. So, so again. And, and I would have to, we would have to get into the nuances of revelation for me yeah, to break do down. That. We could do that another time. We could do that. Yeah, another yeah, time. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you just share my screen real quick? Yeah. I want to show you something because you made a, you made something very uh, interesting. The point that you made in regards to the enjoyment of Gentiles as it pertains to circumcision. The first thing I was, I said to you was, Gentiles are only allowed in the outer court. Gentiles can never come to the inner court whether they're circumcised or not. That inner court is only for Jews, not any Gentile, number one. Number two, they were Gentiles who were feeling estranged from the Most High. Most High never told them, hey, if you want to en enjoy these uh, benefits of being a citizen Israelite, get circumcised. That's not what he said. He told them exactly what to do. He gave them instructions in Isaiah chapter 56. He says, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. See, when Paul is talking, he's mm -hmm. going back to what is being said here in Isaiah 56. The problem is the intertestamental period in which the Jews became extremely strict in dealing with Gentiles mm -hmm. because of the oppression by the Greeks and the Romans. So, um, so what we see Paul saying is nothing new. If you read the Tanakh, let's keep well, reading Wait, wait, wait hold, on, hold on, hold on. Look, check it out. It says, okay. and let not the eunuchs say, behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant. I will give in my house within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them what? An everlasting life, a name, excuse me, that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servant. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, what is he gonna do? These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And it says, the Lord God who gathers the outcast and declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. So the, the essence of the Gentiles cleaving unto Israel, coming into and becoming fellow heirs is not as strange when you read the Tanakh. It's there. The, no, problem listen, is I, the wedge that was driven from this point until the opening of the New Testament. No, yeah. it, I, I would. Well, let me. I'm going to answer this question real quick. Yeah. GCOM, uh, bless you, my brother. Appreciate you. And thank you for the super chat. He says, Mike, do you describe to a thousand year reign? Yeah. I, I, I question. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not dogmatic on the thousand years being a, a literal 1,000 years or not. It potentially could be. Again, I understand prophecy is obscure till fulfillment. Uh, I, there could be a literal 1,000 year reign, whether it's literal 1,000 years or a large period of time. I have no issue uh, with that at all. Again, I'm not real dogmatic that it has to be a literal 1000 year on the nose reign but at the same time i do see that there's a lot of scripture that could potentially point to a literal reign of christ so that, that that's my response there do you, believe, do you believe whatever that position may be that there are some prophecies in the old testament given to israel that would be fulfilled during that period of time as well you know a lot of prophecies that's talking about the righteous branch that's okay. that talk about so so you saying those prophecies are not being fulfilled through Christ? No, no, listen what I'm saying. I do I do think that there is a remnant of Israel that shall be saved. And I think that in that sense, yes, right? But I don't see the fulfillment of those prophecies in the way many do. Now, again, as I'm saying, there's they're Christians uh that that would hold probably you know, that, you know, then Israel will be restored as a nation and a lot of these things will take place. I don't personally hold that view. Personally, I think that those things are fulfilled in in the believers, which make up both Jew and Gentile, the remnant of Israel who inherit those promises and believing Gentiles who are now fellow heirs who will enjoy those promises as well if we embrace Christ. So that's how I see the fulfillment of those. Again, I'm 
again, that's a secondary issue. I, I don't have a knockdown drag out with people oh, on that know, particular you know, point. community. Oh, the Mike, that's a big issue because what we see today is a trajectory from what was re what we're reading in the scripture to what's about to come. Right. So these these prophecies made in the Old Testament and the New Testament was not made amiss. It was made to an audience in expectation of things that were to come in the most high. I agree with you. Word. Wait, he keeps his word. So if he keeps his word, at what point do these things become fulfilled? And when you say Yeshua, when we read the prophecies about the righteous branch that's going to come about in the end times and reestablish the kingdom, is that Jesus that's fulfilling that prophecy? Absolutely, that's Christ fulfilling that prophecy in us, in the believers that is made up of both Jew and Gentile. That beginning of that kingdom has started, and we are that kingdom, and and which is why we will inherit those promises. And so it doesn't exclude believing Israelites from those promises, and God has not uh, changed his mind about those promises. However, we understand through the greater light and understanding, in the and in, in, like I read the scripture in Ephesians 3, that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs and partakers of the same promises. That's all I'm trying to tell wait, you. Wait, it's wait, not I, I, wait, wait, I don't disagree with that. And that's all I'm saying. That's no, all I'm saying. Wait, wait, wait. But but I, I don't disagree with that. I think I think the distinction is I'm saying that the Tanakh has always taught that. I, my position, just so you know, other Mike, is that the church is Israel with Cleveland Gentiles. That's the church. Right. That, well, I would say that the church is Israelites and Gentile. We may be saying the same thing. Wait, wait, but, so wait, but, but the difference is I'm not saying that it had to wait till the, the New Testament authors come on the scene to write about that. All I'm saying is that's already in the Tanakh, but it's because of the things that occurred in history that drove a wedge between the Jews well, adhering to this and the Gentiles wanting to do this. That's, I get what you're saying here. I don't I don't agree with that. I think that it was actual I mean, if we read the text, the text, the text is clear that that it was the law. <laughs> it was the law. And 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 you're you're talking about some of the nuances that arose through the intertestamental period that I don't argue. Sure, there was a lot more uh, uh nuances and, uh, and 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 certainly tensions that sprung up during the intertestamental period. I think you're right there. At the same time, I don't think that's what Paul is referring to. Paul is clearly referring back to the law. The, the new covenant clearly gives the Gentile a status that the old covenant, even if we, I know that it talked about them still inheriting and cleaving to Israel, but, but the status that a Gentile was given now in that he's a fellow citizen. I mean, not just coming in, hanging on your skirt. He walking in on his own. That's the point. That, that that part wasn't clearly seen under the Tanakh. It All wasn't. Right, wait, wait, wait. wait. Get, let, get, I'm going to get you Deuteronomy chapter 29, right? I'm going to read this for you, okay? You, yes, Deuteronomy sir. chapter 29, verse 9 says, carefully follow the terms of this covenant so mm -hmm. that you may prosper in everything you do. All of you are standing today in the presence of the Lord your God, your leaders and chief men, your elders and officials, and all other men of Israel together with your children and your wives. That's for some Israelites. I don't think that women's getting into the kingdom. I just had to say that for my community, but let's keep going. And who the foreigners living in your camps who chop your wood and carry your water. You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God, a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath to confirm you this day as what? His people. Wait, so that's including your leaders, your chief men, your elders, your officials, the other men of Israel, the children, the wives, and the foreigners. Wait, let's keep going. I agree. Oh, I, that's, that, I agree with you there. Wait, wait, follow me. Check it out. To yeah. confirm. Why? To confirm to you this day as his people that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers, I am making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord, God, but also with those who are not here today. So this is incorporating the chief men, the leaders, the officials, the elders, the children, the wives, and the foreigners. The foreigners were always allowed to enter into the covenant. It was not 
something new. It wasn't something novel to say, wow, you know what? Now Gentiles can, can go to the same God that Israel has, who's the God of all nations, Paul reveals. And now all of a sudden, wow, we're giving you a new revelation that now the Gentiles can be called heirs, but it's always been there. Matter of fact, let me, let me show you something else. Leviticus chapter 19. I'm going to show you something really, really interesting because mm -hmm. it's the way that Israelites, natural born, are mm -hmm. supposed to treat the foreigners as their native born and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Wait, you got to, you got to, wait, wait. So you got to treat your neighbor, I mean, your, the foreigner as if he's a native born? So wait, so they entering into the covenant along with Israel. Now the Israelites have to treat the strangers amongst them as one of the native born. My brother, that unity, that love has always been in the text. The problem is history has driven a wedge between the Jews and the Gentiles. So now when Paul comes on the scene, when Yeshua comes on the scene, they have to teach what? The weightier matters of the law and the elements of the law that was overshadowed because of the excessive adherence to the law, which we call the legalism, that has driven a wedge between the Jews and the Gentiles. That's all I'm simply saying. That, that's my position. And I, well, and I just want my fellow Christian brothers and sisters to go back and read the Tanakh because it's nothing as strange when you see that God is consistent. He well, always wanted this for the Gentiles. The problem is because of all the things that occurred historically, the Gentiles were being pushed aside and the Jews were given more provenance. Right. Well, one thing I appreciate is the fact that you aren't one of those who say that Gentiles don't get salvation. Right. Because there's a lot within the community of, of many of the Israelites who believe that or that they only get in as uh, servants or slaves. Right. So I appreciate that if that's what I mean. But I, but I do. I do subscribe okay. to that, that Gentiles are going to serve the Israelites during that millennial kingdom reign. Hold serve on. Them, not be their slaves like we have okay. in America, but serve them the way they did during the time where the Torah was established and it was done with righteousness. Meaning right. that when, when Paul talks about um, uh, Philemon and telling him to go back to his slave master, he told mm -hmm. him, go back to your slave master, but he told the slave master what? How to treat his servant right. as an equal. That let me, let me, Israel was taught to do with the servants amongst them is righteous. It's yeah. not the unrighteousness that people are doing today and what happened historically to me and you and our ancestors. It's a righteous way that you deal with those who are serving well, you. Let me, Go ahead, my brother. Let me Go share ahead. me in on that. No, yes. I don't agree with that. No, there, there's no Israelite <laughs> going to be served by Gentile. Now, you're just saying, but you are, you're saying that that's just during the millennial reign. Correct. Right. Let, and let me, after that, it's going to be a different story. After that, it's going to be. Well, what is the different story? Is it is it equal standing? Like yes. The person, the person. Not only for a kingdom. The reason why there's Gentiles that serving Israelites is so that prophecy will be fulfilled. So that way the uh, people of the world would know that the Jews or the Israelites are the people of God. So all the nations that have oppressed them, when the end times come, there will be remnants that understand the. I would say the guilt, right, that, that their forefathers and their nation, their ethnicity had performed against these Israelites. So they, in good conscience, will cleave unto Israel to support Israel, to help Israel in the things that they're doing. And Israel will be there to reestablish what Yah said that he wanted initially with okay. the Israelites, right. but because that disobedience wasn't able to. So when we read in Torah, you can't beat no servant. You can't. Well, let me, well, right. I got you on that. No well, servant. Let me just say, I just wanted you to, to, to clarify that, yeah, my that, brother. That, that point. So here's the thing. I disagree with that. I really do. I disagree with that. I think that uh, I don't believe that. But again, uh, I, I just don't believe in the servitude aspect, not for a born again believer in Jesus Christ. In Christ, there is no Jew or Greek. There is no bond nor free. I do not believe that. Uh, but let me just real quick. I'm gonna ask her a G con. G con it, talk. It, actually, it's talking about email though. <laughs> I'm just playing. But but <laughs> hold yeah, on. Zachariah chapter fourteen. Yeah, it um, was that. 
Zachariah chapter number 14 answer, uh, G Con. Uh, I, I don't believe Zachariah chapter 14 is fulfilled yet. I think this is yet for the future. Uh, how is fulfilled? We may, uh, there may be some certain nuances that I think that were written in the language of the people of his day. And so it could have greater light and new Testament fulfillment. We would have to kind of break down, but I do believe Christ is going to come stand on Mount Olive. And, and, and so, uh, I do believe Zechariah chapter number 14 to yet be something future that will take place. All right, real quick. Hold on one second. Awesome discussion. We already looking forward to part two. Uh, yeah, bless so, you, right, what I like to do, can we wrap it wrap it down? Because I don't want to hold you up, Elder Mike. And yeah, 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 yeah. If you don't mind, I'd like to just give my final statement and then I'll I'll, I'll just leave. Um, and I appreciate you for having me on um, because you're one of the few people that I know in the urban apologetic community that is respectful, right? That is willing to allow uh, you know somebody that may have opposing view to engage. Um, you're not disrespectful. You don't try to over talk me, belittle me, disrespect me. So I have to give honor to that because as an elder, you're my elder. I have to say you are a good example of an elder. Right. And I think that that transcends whatever your your theological disposition is. Right. Is how you carry yourself, how you treat others, because that's the law of love. Right. So I want to I want to definitely give honor to you. And that's why I love jumping on your platform, because I love talking with you because oh, I like you learn something. I got to go look something up. You go look something up. So it's a bit. And these are the things that I think the community needs to see more of, right? Like, like this is how you build in love. Even if you disagree, you build in love. So what I want to say is, and, and I want you also, Elder Mike, when you get a chance, I want you to go back to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10, and then and go look in Genesis chapter 7. The same word there for tahar, meaning clean, the same word is there in both passages, in Genesis mm -hmm. and Leviticus, right? That's the first one. The second thing is, I want to show you a book, Elder Mike. I don't know if you have it. But if you don't have it, I think it. I think it's an excellent book that I think that you should read. Um, let me bring it up right here so you can see it on my. Well, if you can, if you can allow me to share my screen, I'll I'll show it. Let me know if you can see my share my screen. Oh yeah, okay. Well, one sec. Here you go. <clears throat> Do you have this book right here? The the story retold. No, I don't. But I am a fan of G.K. Deal though. Yes, yes. G.K. Okay. Deal is one of my favorite authors. So. Okay, awesome. So the reason why I'm recommending this book to you is because. The one thing, and this is, and, and I guess when you start to read this book, now mind you, I'm recommending you to an author that is, that's not a biased author, meaning that if I'm somebody that only want, like if I was cult minded, I would only give people sources that agree with me, right? Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. I'm not a Christian. I don't identify as a Christian. However, there are Christian sources that I believe that are very objective. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they actually align with my position. And, and their objectivity. And there's some that are really theologically presuppositional and mm -hmm. that dogma hinders them from seeing certain things that are objective. The reason why I want, I, I'm recommending this to you, my brother, if you've never read it, is that there are tons of New Testament introductory works out there, mm -hmm. right? A lot of them for seminary. Have you been through seminary, Elder, Elder Mike? Yes, sir, I have. Okay, me too, all right. So in seminary, you are given textbooks, okay? A lot of these textbooks that deal with New Testament surveys give you authorship, give you a date, a dating, timeline, background, speaker, audience, right? However, this one decided that there was a lack in New Testament introduction books, and that lack is there is no pretext of the Old Testament. So what they do is they weave the Old Testament to all the things that we see in the New Testament to give the New Testament its building blocks. Mm -hmm. You can't have the building blocks of the New Testament without the Old Testament. However, New Testament introductions, they don't never prep you that way. They, they never do that from the ones I've read. I've read a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. This one is different. And, and the reason why I like it is because the things that they say in here are things that I'd be trying to express. Now we know, we can't say G.K. Bill and Benjamin L. Glad that they're they're everything they say is, is is definitive and that's it like scholars don't speak like that right mm -hmm. so what i'm saying is if you read it you better understand my position the second book that i want to recommend that i believe that if you read it you better understand my position is a book that i'm rereading over again and it's mm -hmm. this right here it's called the lost world of genesis one by john h walton now are you have you read his works before any of john h walton's works before no not to my knowledge Scholar, ask your peers your peers love his books right I want to read this real quick and, and then I'm going to close out with this. Um, 
He says here in his introduction, we like to think, and please follow me with this, Mike. Let me fix oh. this real quick and let me know please. your take on it after I'm, I, I conclude because I would love to hear you, what you would say to this. It says, we like to think, can you see it? I don't know if it's too small. Can you read it? That's a little better, yeah. Better? Okay. All right, right here. Is that big enough? Yes, sir. Okay. So we like to think of the Bible possessively, my Bible, a rare heritage, a holy treasure, a spiritual heirloom. And well, we should. The Bible is fresh and speaks to each of us as God's revelation of himself in a confusing world. It is ours and at times feels quite personal. But we cannot afford to let this idea run away with us. The Old Testament does communicate to us and it was written for us and for all humankind, but it was not written to us. And he's saying this from perspective of a Gentile. Now follow me. It was written to Israel. Mm -hmm. It is God's revelation of himself to Israel and secondarily through Israel to everyone else. As obvious as this is, we must be aware of the implications of that simple statement. Since it was written to Israel, it is in a language that most of us do not understand and therefore it requires translation. But the language is not the only aspect that needs to be translated. Language assumes a culture, operates in a culture, serves a culture, and is designed to communicate into a framework of a culture. Consequently, when we read a text written in another language and addressed to another culture, we must translate the culture as well as the language if we hope to understand the text fully. Now, you alluded to this earlier when you was talking about the overall hermeneutical application mm -hmm. of the context of what the Old Testament was written. You said, look, it was written from an author to an audience within a particular cultural you know, framework with particular language cues, et cetera, right? Exactly. However, however, if we go to the New Testament, the New Testament, maybe for the sake of Luke, was all written by Jews. No doubt. What, do, you, do you agree with that or you disagree with that? No, I agree with that, with the exception of Luke. Okay, well, that's what I said, with the exception of Luke. And yeah. therefore, if they are written by Jews, there's a particular cultural framework that needs to be understood to understand what they're conveying. Now, Absolutely. you have different types of Jews. You have an astute Jew like Paul, and you have a rugged fisherman like Peter. Absolutely. They're going to be right with different language cues because of their educational background, or maybe Paul was more traveled as a yeah. Pharisee and Peter was more local. However, in context. Yeah. Yeah. however, they've been predisposed by the Old Testament, which means if Christians today are to understand the New Testament, they are to also fully understand how to hurt them nutically or provide, perform midrash on passages of the Old Testament and align and harmonize it, not do what supersessionists do, which say, oh, all of that has been fulfilled, is done away with, everything's fulfilled in Christ, and that's it. Some amen loneliness believe that as well. But to say, no, look, this will be fulfilled, but this is how it's going to be fulfilled. It was explained here. Exactly. Carried out this way because some changes happened, not with God, but with man. See, see, the changes had nothing to do with the most high. Everything was. Well, some of them weren't. Would, would you agree? I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. I don't want to cut you off. But real quick, let me just ask a quick question. Would you agree? One, there are some things that God intended from the beginning. And there were certain things that were instituted temporarily until he would bring about his ultimate purpose for the greater fulfillment, which is what I was bringing out. I agree with a lot of what you just read in that book. I, I, matter of fact, I can't say I disagree with anything that you read from the book. But that's my whole point. We've got people reading texts from 21st century lenses and they don't get the cultural context. And, and that's why we got a lot of bad exegesis going on today. Yes, sir. Okay, so so yeah, so I, I I do agree, and I think what you're alluding to is in the book of Revelation where it says that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. That's one right? of the things. Absolutely, that, that's one that's of the one of the things. But it's several. So okay, but I'm just saying it because you had you had alluded to that. Well, not I think you actually said that earlier, Early, and, right? I, and I mean, that's why I'm using that as a point of reference. Sure. So yes, I agree. If you're reading it from the from the book of Revelation, you would get that that understanding. But if you're reading just the Tanakh. 
things will be a little bit different. Like, like what I also would like to talk with you is about the proto evangelium, right? And, yes, and see what the tradition is on that. Yeah, to see what you said on a, at another time, because yes, that, that also is extremely important in regards to its fulfillment. How was it fulfilled? And I'd like to share some stuff with you then. But to end off, uh, my only gripe, not with you, because I can't say it's really with you. I think the things that we disagree on is just, it's just purely theological. The approach that we take, I think, is very um, structural and methodological. I just think that because our vantage points are different, that is why we interpret it the way we do. I only encourage my brothers and sisters who are Christians to please read books that predispose you to understand the foundation of the Old Testament so you can understand in the mind of those Jews who identify Yeshua as the fulfillment of prophecy. Because you see Alton, he said earlier, right? He said, well, Jesus says that the law, he said that the law and prophecy said was, was revealed through him. But what's the context? The context was all the prophecies that was quoted in the New Testament is the things that related to Yeshua. If we keep it in context, we can't say, well, everything well, was written about him. But I think that's what he would have been saying as well. You, right? I mean? we, can't, we can't say that uh, we can't say a situation like, you know, the fact that um, um, Judah and his brothers, that their sister was raped. That's something to do with Jesus. I'm like, what? That has nothing to do with Jesus. What does it have to do with Jesus? You know what I'm saying? But the prophecies that were quoted by the authors are the ones that they identified in the New Testament that was bringing the light to those passages and no. basically to show that Yeshua was the fulfillment, the final for the ultimate fulfillment of these things. And we should take that contextually. So thank you, brother Mike, for letting me on. I appreciate you, my brother. I would love to. I mean, I could talk to you forever. Yeah, I just we'll keep set something going. up to a four part two. They already asking for okay, it. Because, you know, we, we just probably don't have times of our day as busy men, as fathers, and parents, and leaders, or whatever. But what I'm saying is, I love talking with you because even in our disagreements, we're still a student of truth. I'm still here to learn first. I'm still here to, as my elders, show you my respect. To, to to engage with you so my my community can see this is how we should treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because when you stand on truth, I don't have to curse you out of the mic. I don't have to yell at you. I ain't got to scream at you. I ain't got to call you no names. Like, yo, you going to hell? I never, ever said that to you in my life, Elder Mike. I mm -hmm. never said you was going to hell. <laughs> I never said the most I go destroy you. You know what I'm saying? Now, I may have some, some issues of you being unclean by eating pork and stuff. But, <laughs> but in the text, check this out, Elder Mike. A lot of Christians don't stick realize. Stick with me. Stick with me, Doc. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna yeah, help yeah. you with all that. <laughs> yeah. but, but check it out. But a lot of Christians don't realize by eating pork, it did not say that you would be uh, killed because there's capital punishment based on capital offense. Eating pork was not a capital offense, meaning that it made you unclean, and you had to go through a ritual purification in order for you to be clean to come back into the assembly. So it was something that was encouraged not to do, but there was no capital punishment attached to it. Now, in the latter times, if you continuously, with the knowledge of the truth, disobey it with a stone cold heart, now you're going to be judged differently, right? However, oh, yeah. you're going to be judged on, on Christ's righteousness from, from now till the end. Correct. So, so you're going you're you're the law perfectly. It differs. So I don't think you're doing it with a mind of, 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 of stubbornness and willful rebellion towards god right that's when it becomes a point where now you got to get destroyed you know what i'm saying so so that is my position i thank yeah. the most time for allowing this opportunity i'm i thank you my brother and yeshua for allowing this dialogue i pray we have many more this was your platform i'll make sure i honor that and if you need anything my brother please let me know i'm here to support you you know what i'm saying if you need anything if i can help you can email me or hit me up on facebook let's stay in touch and until we meet again my brother i pray the most high keeps you in love mm -hmm. protects your household covers you and and we'll speak again, y'all willing. Well, before you go, real quick, real quick. And, and I, first, I want to say thank you so much for your respect. You, you're always very respectful, which is why I don't have an issue talking with you as well. I certainly appreciate that. Like I said, we had one. We went overnight. At least I'm on the Eastern time. I think we talked till like five, Four six, plus seven more. hours. Man, man. <laughs> yeah, it was five hours. Hours. Yeah. So, so um, I always enjoy our dialogues as well. Uh, I think they are good, but we can show respect, even though we may disagree. Uh, can you answer this super chat real quick before you go? Oh right here, my God. No, I'm not going to answer that. The reason oh. why, because he asked this like a year ago in a super chat and I answered it for him I, and the video was out there. So I'm not going to answer it for okay. G. -Con. Not right. in disrespect for you, Elder Mike. It's because he's asked me something redundant and I love my brother G. Con, right? But he's asking me something redundant that I already answered 
I'm trying to figure out which which um I'll send you the video. I'll look for it and I'll send the video where he asked the same thing. I answered it, and me and him had a dialogue about it. Why is he asking me that? I don't know why he asked. But I'm, I'm oh, well, that's between y'all. I just want to. I, he, she called my friend. He asked. He's my friend. He cool. He cool. Yes, sir. All, All right. right. Well, thank you. That's a lot. Anytime. Uh, Peace I, and blessings. I, I, shalom till we meet again, Elder. Okay. All right, my friend. Thank you.